of the Sports Authority to order. Uh, the purpose of today's meeting is to further review and discuss documents related to the Titan Stadium deal. And uh, I assure you, we will not be taking action today, but we will have a lot of discussion. I want to thank the members of the authority for being with us this morning and being flexible in scheduling this meeting. I think we had one director who actually came directly from the airport. So, Director Farner, thank you for your commitment. Uh, I think that uh, just indicates the commitment that we have to this process. Also, I'd like to thank the Titans and Nissan Stadium for hosting us today. And so we're not going to take a lot of time on the front end because we have we want to hear from a lot of sources. We're going to uh, I would like to acknowledge our council representatives. We have council member Brett Withers with us this morning. Thank you for being here. And also council member Tanya Hancock. Thank you for being here. With that uh, agenda calls for Russ Simons, chief listing officer and managing partner at Venue Solutions Group. And to the board members, you'll find uh, VSG's preliminary memo and the facility condition assessment behind tabs one and two in your binders. Good morning, Russ. Good morning, Madam Chairman. And it's a delight to actually be in front of you once again. Uh, I was thinking about when I came here that the last time I stood before this body was approximately 2003 when I had been asked to come and give a preliminary estimate of what it might take to cover the then Adelphia Coliseum. And I didn't want to be in front of you today without thinking about the many people before that have actually contributed to certainly my growth in our community, but also the sports authority in our community. So I'm thinking about Dick Lodge and Kitty Moon and uh, Ed Temple, Kevin Lavender and Denny Botteroff. So it's a, it really is a genuine uh, pleasure to be in front of you today. So I have, uh, you can see the presentation, I think, in front. And so we'll dig into it. So background, uh, and I'm not going to go into the same amount of depth as I did in front of the uh, East Bank Stadium Committee in, uh, uh, on Monday, uh, in respectful of your time and the other items on your agenda, but I will hit the most important points. So I've skinnied it up just a little bit. Main thing here is our project team. Uh, you can see who they are uh, there. The most important part about that uh, project team is uh, amongst that team, they have had 118 NFL related projects as we go forward. So a team of experts throughout the industry and also with the amount of energy and excitement that the, the proposal from the Titans has uh, created, it was, uh, it was somewhat of a challenge to find uh, the right people uh, to support me who, are, who aren't chasing the Titans work. So uh, it was, uh, uh, it was important to have a truly independent team to be able to take a view of this going forward. Um, again, I'm, again, I'm not going through this, but Venue Solutions Group, we led, we led the team overall. You don't really you remember Mike Woolley, I'm sure. Uh, Legends Project Management, uh, they actually were uh, led our cost estimation portion as we move forward. Um, Manhattan Construction. Uh, Robust uh, history, uh, including AT&T Stadium, NRG Stadium, Raymond James, and others. And some specialty consultants uh, from the industry. Uh, Henderson Engineers for MEP, Thornton Tompensetti for uh, structural, Idibri for uh, technology, and uh, VDA from, uh, from vertical transportation. So beginning with uh, uh, our scope of work uh, to independently evaluate and provide projected costs uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the stadium. I mean, this all began here with you in a request to find out what, uh, what the cost would be uh, uh, of a renovation of the, uh, uh, of the stadium itself. In addition to that, we conducted a limited facility condition assessment of this facility. I say limited because we focused on uh, we focused on the areas of the building that would have the largest potential cost uh, implications to uh, uh, to Metro in a period of time between 2022 and 2026. And those areas were again MEP structure, technology, and vertical transportation. The requirements under the existing lease, I think you know these as, as well as, uh, as everybody. Uh, the wholesale renovation uh, would be necessary to be compliant with the terms of the lease. And that's the result of the effort, our professional opinion, and, and the result of the effort that we took forward. The existing lease requires the sports authority to fund all capital expenditures to keep the stadium in first class condition. And you're probably aware of a lot of uh, discussion about 
what actually first class condition means. Uh, having a level of improvements for new technology from time to time, finding a reasonable number of comparable facilities and a definition of comparable facilities, meaning uh, not only the facilities that are listed there, but in the Titans lease, uh, it refers to uh, NFL facilities uh, from 10 years before to 10 years after. So the uh, the actual data set for that, for to meet that criteria is about 17 facilities throughout the NFL. So we looked at all 17 of those facilities. We looked at uh, what was being proposed by the Titans. And uh, in our professional opinion, once again, Hard Rock Stadium is the thing that related most to the size, scale, uh, and nature of the renovations that the Titans were proposing for, uh, for Nissan Stadium. And it's important to have a basis for comparison. And so this allowed us to be able to look at the kinds of, uh, and it, it is, by the way, the latest renovation in, in the NFL. So we looked at the kinds of things that were being proposed in the titans Ginsler uh, hastings plan against what was most recently done, completed in 2017 from Hard Rock Stadium, and to be able to use that as a, as a comparative point to make sure that we were looking at things that were consistent with uh, current industry standards. From a master plan standpoint, that's the Titans did share with us the Ginsler Hastings plan. I understand that that plan has now also been shared with uh, the Metropolitan Council. The uh, Again, materially, uh, Hard Rock Stadium renovation was the closest example that we could find in the NFL. And I think you know this already, but it bears saying that there's a wide diversity in NFL stadiums. There's a wide diversity in their ownership and their management and, uh, and operation. And so there's not a consistent pace. Everybody doesn't do the same thing the same way. Everything doesn't, everybody doesn't do the same thing uh, in their own market, depending on market conditions and the nature of their franchise, nature of their ownership. So uh, again, we go back to Hard Rock Stadium as the most comparable uh, proxy for, uh, for an independent design. Again, we looked at comparable stadium review with the, uh, the stadium and the results of this for us and our facility condition assessment uh, told us that literally to renovate this building, it would have to be strip, stripped down to its bare bones. There are, uh, we're gonna come up to a concept called enabling projects. I'll describe that in a second. But essentially the nature uh, of this building and where it sits today in order to actually execute a full scale renovation to meet current industry standards, uh, we believe that this building would have to be stripped down to its, uh, to its bones. The bones, by the way, structurally are very good, uh, but the systems within that are at the end or in some cases beyond their expected usable life. And therefore, uh, just to make sure that you have understand the scale from our perspective is we'd have to take it, basically take it completely apart to rebuild it in a, in a, in a renovation program. I guess I'll go back. And when we looked at the Ginsler Hastings plan, particularly when we looked at that plan against the Hard Rock Stadium, we found it to be consistent with comparable, uh, comparable stadiums, comparable NFL work uh, in the marketplace today. We looked at the cost, uh, and, and it says September. I think that uh, actually the Titans presented this in May. I apologize for that. But uh, presented that it would be approximately $1.8 billion in order to, uh, uh, to do what needed to be done and, and, and also anything that would have to be done after renovation through an extended lease period to, I think, uh, 2027 or 2039. 2039. So as we, looked at, uh, as we looked at that and we, make the com and we made the comparison, uh, it, was, it was pretty clear that uh, we we're going to get to the same area of cost, but we got there in a, an entirely different way. And to be fair, with the, uh, with the Titans effort, uh, I, you know, and I'm, I'm a third party here, but what I saw was the, their effort to try to get you the best possible answer in, in a reasonable period of time. And because of that, uh, the Titans and uh, uh, Turner Construction AECOM uh, had to make a number of assumptions. And fortunately for us, we did not have the same time pressure, meaning uh, we had the opportunity to actually get in the building, do the surveying, uh, do the background. So we had an appropriate amount of time with which to generate uh, the, uh, the estimates that we have for cost, uh, both in the enabling projects uh, and in the uh, renovation itself, and also what the capital expense uh, costs might be uh, under the terms of the lease continuing to 2039. Uh, these are some of the uh, pieces that we use from a methodology standpoint. Uh, fortunately, we had the construction database. 
looking at, at current pricing uh, of the things that are going on in the uh, uh, in the NFL community today, and there is a significant amount of work going on uh, in in this building type. We this building represents one of a, a great many buildings that were sort of the age of stadiums, and some that come to mind very quickly would be M&T Bank Stadium and uh, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, used to be Heinz Field. Candidly, I can't say the name of the new company. Uh, uh, there's a uh, Tampa Bay is in this. There are a number of facilities that are in this same time period and that for those facilities and those communities are undergoing the same kinds of discussions that we're going under here today. Cleveland is a, another really good example of, of that overall. As I said, we had the, uh, the 2017 facility condition assessment. There was some question of uh, uh, in trying to understand the difference between a facility condition assessment and a comparison to a, uh, a full on renovation project and a facility condition assessment really being benchmarking the uh, the equipment and systems in the building and their current condition and extrapolating that into a into a capital expense matrix which would then allow you to have some idea to plan for capital projects going forward facility condition assessment does nothing to address NFL current standards does nothing to address uh, revenue or fan amenities or any of that it is it is a straightforward uh, uh, system and equipment um, evaluation and so uh, it's easy to understand how two things could be uh, uh, how people might look at the delta between what we brought forward and the facility condition assessment in 2017 and hopefully that explanation helps uh, folks understand uh, we reviewed the Ginsler uh, Hastings uh, package uh, we did the limited facility condition assessment here in the building with great cooperation from the building and their partners and then also applied current national market escalation and supply chain information. Enabling projects, and you can read the definition there, but essentially uh, these are projects that would need to be completed before any material renovation took place. And here are some examples for you. Uh, the uh, domestic water piping system is at or beyond uh, its expected usable life. Uh, we have some of the same situations with regard to mechanical and electrical systems. Uh, there are remedial repairs uh, going on right now, uh, and they will need to continue going on uh, with regard to con concrete structure and mason masonry. Um, some outdated and inefficient concessions, food uh, equipment, light fixtures. In the 2017 facility condition assessment, we made a recommendation to move to LED light fixtures. My understanding is about half of that has been accomplished in the period of time between then and now. And we, uh, and we, they, that project needs to be continued. And then uh, vertical transportation. There are some challenges with the original uh, vertical transportation uh, that we outline in our report. Capital projects, this uh, this part of the timeline says after the renovation is over and in the ensuing years through the remainder of the extended lease with the Titans, this is the kind of monies that Metro would have to consider in terms of meeting their obligations under the lease. And so here you have the math, uh, the, the enabling projects, as I said, projects to be done before the actual uh, renovation takes place. Uh, the, the renovation uh, construction costs, soft costs and contingency. Uh, the adjusted project costs and the uh, capital costs moving forward. So I'm really going to skip the comparable stadium review uh, for in the sense of time. Essentially, is what I said. We look through the components of the stadium. We look through uh, all of the information that was available to us just to ensure that we were using uh, a fair comparison on, uh, on the... Uh, on the analysis of the Ginsler plan. This, uh, what is first class? I, I mentioned that question, and I think that that question will continue to be struggled with by, by the council and others. Essentially, our position is that as a highly experienced group of people uh, in NFL stadiums, in our professional opinion, we looked at uh, comparable stadiums. We looked uh, deep dive into Hard Rock as a comparable facility. We also looked at the new builds uh, because at the end of the day, uh, renovation has got to meet 
the standard for today and prepare the facility to actually uh, function uh, going forward. So you know, a, a renovation environment would be you know, for the next 20 years, let's say, for, for, for an example. And so everything we do has to be uh, get, get us to the standard today, but also anticipate what's going to be necessary uh, through the remaining uh, time in the contract itself. The condition assessment, again, I won't go through all of these, just overall our process, on-site reviews, interviews with the stadium staff, visual inspection of the uh, of the areas and the equipment, and a, a process to identify any, uh, any of the areas that were most at risk and develop the capital uh, matrix plan for that four years. Some examples in each of these, again, I'm not going to go through all of them. I talked about uh, domestic water. It's important for us and for you to be uh, to consider no matter what uh, process this takes going forward, how we deal with the current situation in domestic water. Structure, the, as I said, the bones of the structure are good, but there are some challenges in structure that uh, uh, you have an example here of some, these are cast in place steps in the original uh, uh, in the original stadium, and uh, and some of those, uh, a, a good many of those are deteriorating. The Titans have exercised a plan. Uh, they're replacing 80 to 100 of those a year, so that is going forward. If you have attended a game in this in, in the stadium, it's likely you've seen evidence of this. Uh, there is also evidence of corrosion uh, uh, in the scoreboard uh, structures uh, and areas where uh, uh, floor slabs might be leaking through expansion point uh, expansion joint damage uh, and, and the like. But as we say, the primary structural components, including slams and beams and columns, are in generally good condition. Technology, uh, there are a few things in the, in the technology and maybe the most important one is, is that although the systems that are there right now were installed originally in, in 2012, they are at or beyond the end of their expected usable life. And I think you are already experiencing and you will continue to experience a lack of available parts. So one of our recommendations when we get to the end will be that there are several areas where we think that actually going out and acquiring those parts right now to protect your uh, obligations over the course of the next four years would be a sound financial move uh, in terms of making sure that you have the assets and resources to, uh, to meet your obligations. Elevators. Eight original elevators, 12 high-speed units in 2012. Uh, the freight elevators were modernized in 2017. The original eight uh, are uh, at the end of their expected usable life. And again, one of our recommendations uh, is to get uh, uh, some of the equipment that's going to be necessary to maintain and sustain those elevators uh, throughout the remaining, four, uh, the remaining four years, drivers and controllers. Escalators. Uh, it's interesting because I always assumed that there were more than four, but there are really only four in the uh, in the building. However, they are uh, approaching the end of their usable life. Uh, the escalators are actually in very good condition for their age, but it's just something that uh, we need to be paying attention to in terms of how we go forward. And also, uh, the lack of available parts from an obsolescence standpoint is something that we recommend that uh, uh, that you look at seriously in terms of uh, of being protective. The recommendations are. Uh, when I say enhanced preventative maintenance, uh, preventative maintenance is being done. I'm saying that there are certain areas that re may require additional attention. So enhanced preventative maintenance in, the, uh, in an effort to extend the expected usable life of all of these systems. And, and here's what's important about that. This, uh, this vulnerability, for lack of a more elegant term, of about $37.1 million uh, in the period of time between now and 2026, uh, is, we're not saying you have to spend that money. As a matter of fact, I'd be happy if you didn't have to spend nearly any of it. So the idea is that's the max vulnerability that we see in these areas between now and 2026. But efforts can be by purchasing some of that equipment ahead of time and by really enhanced uh, preventative maintenance uh, can be made to actually extend the, the remaining usable life of this equipment and system. So I'm not somebody as a former facility operator, uh, I am not somebody who wants to go out and spend money just to spend money. So I think that uh, it's one thing to know what the vulnerability is. The next is, is how do we, how and what action do we take in order to extend the life of these systems to ensure that we do not have to spend those large scale dollars. The, uh, some of the components due to obsolescence, I mentioned drivers and controllers, uh, scoreboard modules, uh, the sound system processing. It's just, uh, it, it's just 
beyond the end of its usable life. And if the sound system processing goes out or something happens in the domestic water system, there can be consequences in your ability to host events. Uh, and have spares for electrical switch gear and some of the things that are, again, nearing and or at the end of their expected usable life. And we're saying that because of a couple things. One is the equipment itself, uh, uh, because of obsolescence, there's not a lot of it available. You just can't go to the store and get it. And also in the con current conditions we have with regard to supply chain issues, uh, even if you could get it, it could take uh, uh, an, an inordinately uh, long period of time in which to actually acquire it and, and be able to fix the system. So. Um, the last thing really talks about uh, a continuity plan. So basically putting together our recommendations for the kinds of equipment that you may want to have uh, available as inventory ahead of time. And then also uh, really playing a scenario that said, if this happened in this specific piece of equipment or system, how would we react to it? And how can we ensure that we can uh, and go forward with the, not just the NFL, but the many events, uh, both public and private events uh, uh, in, uh, in Nissan Stadium throughout the remainder of its usable life, depending on what decisions are made on how it goes forward. And at that point, I'm happy to attempt to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Chair, I, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, to begin with, uh, who sets the industry standard for stadiums? The so, NFL or some facility that's recently built and then someone says that's the standard that we want. How yeah, is so the, the NFL has uh, sets guidelines that are uh, necessary for them to uh, uh, for a game to be produced. And it's done in a great many areas. It's done in the field. It's done in broadcast. It's done in data, that type of thing. But the second part of your question is really the uh, is really the core of it. The current industry standard uh, is really set by the uh, by the industry itself. There's not a there's not an authority that says this is the guideline. But as you look at, for example, the 17 facilities that are in your comparable facility set, then from there you can extrapolate what is the current industry standard? What is the industry standard in terms of new builds? What do new facilities have? Look at Allegiant Stadium is a great example. What are the things that Allegiant Stadium has? And then you can't you shouldn't really be thinking about how do I start with less than that, knowing that that's the standard for today and what's going to be looking going forward. You might wonder why I don't mention SoFi Stadium. Um, I spent six years in SoFi Stadium. I know it intimately. Uh, and uh, it's an appropriate stadium for Los Angeles, California, but it's not something that I hold up and, and say that this is what you should compare uh, what we do in, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Does the NFL have a list of standards uh, for a facility's functions and um, components and what have you? Is there a list? They, and did the NFL uh, comment on this particular stadium? Uh, second answer, first answer is no. The list that the NFL has is performance in each of the categories I previously listed. Performance for field, performance for data, performance for, uh, performance for broadcast, those kinds of things. With regard to the remainder of the components of this or any other NFL stadium, they're pretty much set by the marketplaces. And what's important in one stadium may not be important to another, and what's important to one community may not be important to another. And I think you've gone over uh, a lot of the conditions of this stadium that uh, are deficient. But if you uh, renovated this stadium, uh, removed all of the deficiencies, um, would it, and that's including the replacement of all the components and equipment mm -hmm. that have uh, ex ex expanded, they, um, expired their useful life, yes, sir. would this stadium meet NFL standards? So the way I'll answer that is uh, in our in our assessment, when I looked at the Ginsler Hastings plan, if you executed that plan, you would and the enabling projects, you would essentially have a brand new building. And so the answer to that would be yes. Now, did the Ginsler plan have new functions included in it? They had new allocations of uh, they had new allocations of spaces within the context of here, but I think the functions are similar. They, they look to enhance uh, fan amenities, uh, concessions, restrooms, uh, sales areas, uh, 
But what they are is consistent with what we see not only in the new build, but in the Hard Rock Cafe, in the Hard Rock Stadium renovation. Any in addition to what we have now? I did any not see. Function? I did not see anything yeah. outside of uh, uh, the things that would have been necessary to uh, to support the current industry standard for the NFL. I want to wait a minute. I'm still thinking. And I'm patient. Okay. Okay. So we'll come back. Sure. Okay. Director Atkins. Uh, Madam Chair, I was just curious if we're talking about current NFL standards and the interpretation of first class condition, is it appropriate for maybe uh, Burke to address from the NFL perspective or should we wait till later? And That's today? fine. If you'd like to contribute to this conversation, we'd love to have the feedback. Thank you, Russ. Don't go too far. You're not off the hook yet. So I, I think the honest the honest answer here, here is there's there's a number of things in this process where I understand lines of questioning about how much would it cost to bring the stadium to first class condition or NFL standards or what are NFL standards. And um, there's a lot of unsatisfying answers in that because there's there's not a magic number. And um, NFL standards means a lot of things. Um, there's an NFL expectation, I can tell you, as a one of 32 people in my role, um, I hear about what their expectation is for facilities. Um, there are specific standards that um, Dan and uh, Adolfo are part of our legal team. They can tell you it's hard to actually track down a single manual. Um, I got a memo on Monday of this week saying this year during winter games, your stadiums need to meet these criteria. It's just kind of this rolling expectation. Uh, keeping up with safety for fans, safety for players, uh, safety for, um, you know, the environment around um, pr uh, production changes, right? As uh, the, the production of uh, television broadcasts change, um, there's, there's a changed expectation. Um, one of the things that I keep hearing from, uh, from our production team is that the way that this building was set up to be broadcast in the mid 90s for games, like we're we're almost out of time to to bring this building up to speed if you know production value of for example now Amazon is broadcasting Thursday night football on streaming services we don't have the bandwidth to necessarily just keep keeping up with production standards but all of this is very unsatisfying i know because there's not a manual i can hand to you that say that says th these are the NFL standards there there isn't such a thing that's that it's just this collection of expectations and memos and and, and just just an expectation that there's there's only 32 of these organizations in the in the world and and the NFL has expectations these, these venues are going to be of a certain quality. Um, I would also go back to on first class condition. It's the same thing. Um, understanding the, the process that the VSG took um, and, and appreciating it. It's really hard to get to a magic number. Right. This body asked us to uh, to do a study back in, in March to give you a number. What what is. What is it that the sports authority may owe if we do nothing? Um, and we did the best that we could. We went to Turner uh, Construction and asked them to review the building, to look ahead to 2039 and say, if this lease was in place through from now till 2039, what is that number? Um, it's impossible to get a magic number. Um, interestingly, these numbers are coming in close, right? Uh, VSG versus Turner. But um, what you're asking is, uh, my, my interpretation of the lease, I can go through the technicalities, right? My interpretation of the lease in very layman's terms, Nashville is not expecting to be the best stadium in the country. It's not expecting to be the worst stadium in the country. It's expecting to just keep up, right? And um, the reality with this building, when I think back to 1996, when this building was designed, just think back to what stadiums were like at that time. There wasn't an AT&T stadium in Dallas. There wasn't, certainly wasn't a SoFi stadium, not even an Allegiant stadium um, that was mentioned. And uh, the, the city and the team, what they, what they put in the lease was a way to just try to, try to have the building in Nashville keep up. And so what they did was they, they listed a, a few specific facilities, including Hard Rock Stadium in Miami and, and others. Um, and then they said buildings built 10 years before or after. Let's just kind of keep our eye on those and will reasonably try to keep up with those. And uh, an analogy I thought of recently, this building wasn't built poorly. This building wasn't built, um, you know, quote, on the cheap. 
It was the last VHS player. It's, this, this, is, this was a construction era that, it, that was quickly passing, and it was a fan expectation that was quickly passing. Um, we kind of sat out the DVD era. Um, right as soon as this building was built, um, that 10 year window after, that are also comparable facilities under this lease. They really started having a different technology, a different fan experience. And we've kept up a little bit, but for the most part, we've kind of sat out that DVD era. And the way that I look at it from a dollars and cents perspective, I think the question isn't, what's the magic number? You're not gonna find out what that magic number is. The question is, what's the risk? What's the risk to the sports authority and ultimately the, the taxpayers? Because effectively what this lease is, is it just says we need to be keeping up and it's, it's an unknown number. And the DVD era of stadiums is closing and we're going into the streaming era. era. Um, Miami's already done their work, so I understand why BSG would have, would have taken that as an example. But um, Cleveland is another comparable facility. They're exploring a massive renovation and or a potential new build. Jacksonville is exploring a, a massive new uh, renovation. Charlotte has talked about when their lease expires at the end of this decade, I think it's 2028, they're looking to do a new building. All of these, these other facilities are getting into kind of this streaming era. And so this now goes back to, some of, some of you have been on this board for, for the last four or five years. We have seen this coming, right? That the, there's, a, there's an aging building built in an era gone by and a lease that puts the obligation of keeping up on the taxpayers for the most part. And that's really an unacceptable outcome. And so what we've been working towards is, can this building be renovated in a way that brings it into this modern, this, this modern era uh, and, and believe, you know, sets it on a course to stay that way for another generation? And that's the work that we did. And when the pricing ultimately came back, that didn't seem like there was wisdom in it. There, there wasn't really a way to, to get that even funded, not through the city, the, the, the team has debt ceiling limits imposed by the, um, by the league. That's when we just took the step back. And, and the reason why we've moved towards the possibility of a new building was because when the state came in and, and saw a vision for potentially new building, so long as it had a roof and was, was, uh, was gracious enough and to, to give funding towards that effort, the pieces started to, to fall into place to have a responsible and sustainable solution that where that risk column currently is on the taxpayer, ultimately to keep up, we switch it. And, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a plan, a collaboration across the state, uh, city revenue bonds with these sources we've talked about before, team, private investment, PSLs, to get a building funded, some of those revenue sources continuing to keep the building uh, updated uh, it, to the extent that debt service is covered and, and there's surplus. And then from there, whatever it costs, whatever in 2045, it means to be a, a great NFL building or first class NFL building. That's gonna be something the risk shifts to the team and the taxpayers are removed from that equation. So anyway, very, very long winded way of saying NFL standards, the dollars and cents, you know, just sitting on the sidelines here. As I think about it, having lived in this for a long time, there aren't satisfying answers necessarily, but at a really, really high level, when you kind of absorb all of it, it's really about this risk factor of that that unknown, and and this is why we've been trying to take the the course we have. What is the difference between the cost? Why is what is the difference between the cost of upgrading the existing stadium and building a new stadium? Where did that come in? In the system systems, did it come in in the uh, uh, going from the DVD to the streaming uh, systems? Is that where the cost is? Yeah, a lot of it is behind the walls. Um, you know, Russ may be in a better position to give you a, a straight answer on this, so I should probably sit down. Mm -hmm. I will give you, I'll give you the answer from the work that we did in the spring, and then I'll, I'll let Ross, Russ uh, get up and give his answer. Um, some of it certainly is in changing the fan experience. Um, the, the first class facility is not, it's not about opulence, right? And, and from what I've been told, it's, you know, one flooring product versus another is, doesn't move the needle that much, or this lighting fixture versus another doesn't move the needle that much. It's about, it's about the square footage and the spaces. And um, this building is lower bowl clubs, suites, upper bowl. Um, and in the modern fan experience, like Miami, like Cleveland's already done, like Jacksonville's already done, like Charlotte's already done, and are looking to do more, are 
it's a diversity of experience. There's lots of different ways to consume the game. That is the modern uh, NFL stadium experience. And, and so in creating those spaces or converting spaces in here to those spaces, there's definitely a cost with that. But the difference with our building is that, um, you know, some of those utilities that, that would need to be replaced or, or uh, you know, overhauled in a big way. Um, you know, reinforcement of materials that being an outdoor facility have, have reached the end of their useful life. The technology that is either nearing the end of its useful life or, you know, wasn't a part of this building in the first place. Those are the sorts of things that carry, carry a pretty heavy cost. I'll sit down and let Russ answer the question as the expert, though. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Any other questions for Russ? Well, I, I think I want to go back to the to, uh, to the point that when the stadium was built, it was built as, as a football stadium uh, with the ability to use the facility for other entertainment venues. Now it appears that what's happening is we're building a, a stadium that can uh, house football games, but primarily have the ability to use it for a multitude of other venues year round. And, so having and, been here through both of these processes, as you'll remember, I was the senior vice president general manager of the Bridgestone Arena. Uh, and uh, and a not a, not a named participant, but actively participate in discussions in terms of how Adelphia came about. Uh, I don't I don't think that scope has changed whatsoever. I think that when uh, when then Mayor Bredesen envisioned the Delphia Coliseum, uh, it was to do exactly as you said. It was to be the home of the uh, of the Tennessee Titans. But even in the uh, even in the uh, enabling uh, legislation for your authority, it talks about your ability to actually produce events here. And I think it was envisioned as being a place that was going to be an important piece of infrastructure to com uh, to contribute to Nashville uh, overall as we grew our community. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's any different here. I am saying that when I looked at the Ginsler Hastings report, that I didn't detect. There's nothing in there that is not intended to actually drive the core focus, which is the home of the NFL. But in doing so, and in much the same way as Burke has just outlined, when you have a diversity of ways that you can experience that game, that also means you'll have a diversity of opportunities for private non-NFL and other users. So, um, I, again, back to your original statement, I actually don't think the scope of this has changed whatsoever between the two conditions. Now, I have a question. I'm, I'm probably jumping around, but in this report, uh, the <clears throat> term sheet, it mentioned that the authority would be able to participate in the selection of the architect. If it's okay, can we wait until we get into that piece of the dialogue? Oh, okay, sure. Uh, okay. We're going to definitely j j jump okay. deep into that piece. So if we can kind of focus on this assessment piece and then we'll move into that next. I was running for the door. I, just... <laughs> <laughs> I took care of you that time. <laughs> Do you have any other additional questions for Russ? Um, around the I'm, I'm just still curious about the small difference between the renovation of the existing uh, facility and the construction of a new facility. What is it, 1.5? Uh, 1.95 billion yeah, to right. 2.1 billion. So a couple of things that I think will resonate with you. One is, is you eliminate the uh, $256 million worth of enabling projects. Like if we were just, if we were just, you know, apples to apples saying, hey, that wouldn't normally be a, that normally wouldn't be a, a condition in terms of evil or partial or large scale uh, renovation. Some parts of it would be, but that's an imposition on, on top of the comparative costs for, uh, to, to actually construct the Ginsler Hastings plan. In addition to that, as I know that you are uniquely aware, we're in a time where uh, escalation has, uh, you know, there have never been situations with regard to escalation, with regard to supply chain. And I listen, I know everybody hears these words in the media, but I, to give you an example, normally if I wanted to buy uh, an NFL sized uh, video board, I could do that in anywhere from, from four to six months. I can't get anybody to talk to me today about anything less than a year of delivery time. And as again, you well know that those create consequences downstream. So you have that, and then you have uh, 
the, just the overall cost, as I said. And because we are in an uncertain time, the most uncertain time in, in my experience, 40 years in construction, <laughs> looks like you got as many as me. Uh, we can't count on anything. We can't get a price to hold for 10 days. And so therefore, if we were having this conversation three years ago, you would have a much different contingency number. So when you add the math of those things together, you start to say, well, wait a second, that number actually appropriately anticipates the conditions on the ground today and may have been different in another era or another time, but that's the science. And that's why the number is what it is. Okay. Sir. Director Deering. Uh, I'm interested in knowing, you're talking about gutting the building if we do uh, uh, yes, sir. try to reinvent this building. What would be the timetable for doing that? Would, would the Titans have to shut down and play football somewhere else for a year? So uh, I, I can't, I, sh I don't really think I should answer that. So there are some ways to do it. Um, one of the ways you would do it is over a period of time and you would, uh, you would sort of eliminate any activity in the building during the off seasons, let's say loosely three seasons to do that. That would also cause escalated costs. Uh, you know, and there's some small work that can be done sort of during the season, but, uh, it's costly. Uh, you have additional, uh, general conditions. You have additional cleanup conditions. You have additional inconveniences and impositions on the team and the fans, uh, there are folks that have uh, taken that approach, so I'm, I'm saying it, it would be possible if that was, if that was sort of on the table. Uh, it would enhance the costs, in my opinion. It would create material inconvenience for both the teams and the fans. But theoretically, you're talking about three years. Three seasons it would equal I don't think years. you could do what's proposed in less than three seasons. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, you referenced Hard Rock. Do you, do you know what that renovation cost? Yeah, in 2023 dollars, uh, their their renovations through throughout their facility uh, for throughout their timeline in 2023 uh, dollars is uh, 1.3 billion. What was it in the year that it was renovated? I apologize, I do not know that answer. I, th what was the renovation? The what last was the cost and what year yeah, was it? The last major renovation completed in 2017 at a at a price of somewhere north of 550 million dollars. I apologize. I thought you were asking what the original building cost. Oh, sorry. Any other questions on the assessment? Yeah, you've asked all that. Okay. <laughs> I have one question. Because I know we have the other yes. piece of our agenda to move to, but um, specific to Hard Rock, uh, what what are the number of parking spaces? Do you know as you were comparing? I actually don't know the number, but uh, if you've been there or you've uh, have seen an image of it, it is not unlike Nissan Stadium in that it is surrounded by a sea of parking. It is not in a sort of a dense urban area, so there is surface parking uh, surrounding the the stadium site, uh, 360 degrees. Is that typical for the 17 comparable facilities you looked at? Or? So each of those is going to be different. For example, um, uh, it, it's actually representative of uh, of an older uh, sort of uh, design philosophy about sort of st sticking something with a donut of parking around it. Uh, a lot of those stadiums, particularly on the Major League Baseball side, have, have sort of gone away. It's really an inefficient use of, uh, from an urban planning standpoint. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know the number, but it's not typical because I don't think, to Burke's point, there is a typical. M&T Bank Stadium is part of two stadiums together in, in, uh, in urban Washington that has uh, very little uh, parking. The Allegiant Stadium uh, in, in Las Vegas, sort of one of the two newest stadiums in the NFL, has uh, 3,500 parking spaces, no more. And your average fan has to walk approximately a mile to get to the stadium itself. So uh there 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 isn't actually a rule of thumb thank you you bet any other questions uh, russ thank you for a very yes. in-depth report uh, we may have additional questions as uh, minds continue to wonder so well, uh, as you're aware i am a citizen of nashville and thank you for the work you do on behalf of our community we appreciate Cheers. it thank you okay so now we will have uh Deputy Mayor Sam Wilcox back with us again. Uh, he shared with us at our last meeting and uh, 
I'm sure that we've had time to let things sink in a little bit and maybe uh, we thought of another walkthrough would be good and an opportunity to have additional questions. We also have Metro Finance Director Kelly Flannery here today and Deputy Law Director Tom Cross and Metro's Bond Council is here with us this morning, Jeff Oldham. So uh, we hope to hear from a series of folks and I think if we don't hear from them all, if you have questions, we have all the players who can address those questions for us. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Bender. Um, this is the exact same presentation we gave about a month ago, and so I'm not going to go through every slide, but if it's helpful, just wanted to level set, and I'll hit the highlights, um, which I think start on slide three. One more. So, um, again, what we're talking about is a new enclosed stadium that'll be about 60,000 seats um, constructed in the parking lot just east of I think east of here, um, between um, current Nissan and, and the interstate. Um, the project budget is not to exceed 2.1 billion, and that includes construction costs, site preparation, demolition of this stadium, all public infrastructure necessary to open the stadium, and a reasonable contingency. That budget also includes um, all, of the, all the infrastructure needed for development in the two parcels um, bordering either side of the new stadium, what we call the Stadium Village, which is in one of the exhibits at the back. Um, but that is land that the city is reclaiming um, for, for our own development purposes. Um, the team has retained Manica Architecture to design the stadium. Uh, David Manica was actually here yesterday presenting to the East Bank Stadium Committee. Um, if you'd like to learn more about that, I'd encourage you all to watch that meeting. Um, our goal is to have the new stadium uh, meet a LEED Gold certification. Next slide. Um, we talked a little bit about, or uh, um, uh, Director Gill, I think you were uh, asked a question about the difference in cost between the renovation and um, renovation in a new build. And I think that's only half the, the, the question um, that we really need to be asking, because a lot of this is about um, cost is one thing, but how do you actually pay for it is the other, right? And so we have very few options to pay for a renovation. Director Flannery can kind of talk about that um, as we go. But this is how we're proposing to, to um, pay for any new stadium. And uh, I think it's important to point out there are major state investments as a part of the new stadium where it's not solely on the taxpayers of Nashville. And that includes a $500 million check from, from the state, um, $840 million from the Titans, NFL, and PSL holders, and then seven hundred and sixty million from uh, uh, sports authority bonds. And those Sports authority bonds are backed by dedicated non-property tax revenue sources. So a 1% hotel tax paid by tourists, uh, a continuation of the sales tax redirect inside the stadium, which is currently enabled on this stadium, um, a redirect of um, the state and local sales tax of 130 acres of the, basically the metro owned and surrounding area of the new campus. Um, and then uh, ticket tax, continuation of the current ticket tax, and then um, team rent. Uh, and, I, and I think that's really important. I, I really just want to hammer home. Those are dedicated revenue sources that we do not, we do not have all of them available to us today. And so, again, we can get into, and we will in, uh, either later in this meeting or in coming weeks, about if we want to pursue a renovation, what that looks like. But certainly not, the, the hotel tax is not available in that scenario. And the 500 million check from the state is not available in that scenario. We have that, so that creates a big funding gap. Um, next slide. Uh, this talks a little bit more about the available sources that I just um, uh, just talked about. The the one thing I want to point out um, again: hotel tax, area sales tax, and um, rent from the team are really the three new sources. Uh, available for any new stadium. I guess I guess area sales tax tax technically is enabled today, but there's very little revenue being generated by the parking lots. Next slide. As you move through those slides, let me just encourage members if you have a question that hits you during the middle of the presentation, I don't want us to be forget anything. So feel free to 
speak up and yeah, uh, sure, President Sam. Okay, yeah. <laughs> when you say team rent, what what do you mean? Rent? Yeah, so team team rent is <clears throat> kind of exactly what it sounds right. It would be rent that they would annually pay to the sports authority. That rent would be calculated on a per user basis charging um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be it's different than a ticket tax it doesn't necessarily need to be passed on to the end user but it's an obligation it's just a way to calculate so it's the rent. not it's not the ticket tax it's right. an addition to the ticket it's tax. an addition to the ticket tax and it's three dollars on non-nfl event um patrons and so it doesn't necessarily have to be passed on in the ticket price, but it's just a way for us to calculate rent. And really the way, the reason why we're doing it that way is because we want to share in the upside of the increase in utilize, facility utilization, right? And so if there are going to be more concerts, if there are going to be more non-NFL events in the new, uh, new stadium, we want to be able to share in some of that upside. So I got a question about, back to your other slide about uh, release and the authority of uh, obligations. And you put it at thirty-two million dollars. Does that include anything on the bonds that the authority has for the remainder of this lease? So that's it's coincidentally very similar numbers. And so there's actually two thirty million-ish numbers. So the thirty-two million is um, maintenance and capital projects that the sports authority and Metro was supposed to pay over the last couple of years, and we just haven't been. Uh, the team has been taking that on, but they have a receivable on their books from us, and you all have a payable on your books from them uh, for $32 million. As part of this new deal, they're willing to waive that $32 million um, IOU. There's also roughly $30 million of revenue bonds still outstanding on uh, the current stadium that would be absorbed in this new project. And so, again, that... <laughs> It would be absorbed into the project budget. Metro. Correct. Yeah. So it'd be absorbed into the two point one billion dollar okay, number. So, so and thirty-two so, million. I think it's up to thirty-five million today. I believe is that correct? Uh, I'm I'm not sure if what latest I, figures. Every time I every time I flip a page, it goes from thirty-two to thirty-three to thirty-five. So I, unfortunately, I think that's just how maintenance works on an agent okay. stadium. But but anyway, but but both go away if we get into the new agreement with the Titans. That's right. And I think the the important part about the thirty million of revenue bonds is it doesn't really go away. It's just rolled into this bigger deal. And it's not general fund money that's going to have to pay for it. It's uh, or or other non um, state or tourism or user revenue sources. Right. Okay. Right now, we don't really have a great way to pay for for those revenue bonds other than what's available now, which is the water pilot. You know, the one million dollar rent, et cetera. Do those so, bonds go out to twenty thirty nine? Yeah. Jeff, we have on it today. Thirty three. Thirty three. Yeah, 2033. 2033. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just curious. Yes. Uh, on the eight, $840 billion Titans, NFL, PSLs, do y'all have a projected breakout of those numbers? Would you anticipate the pools for funding that number? Yeah. Bert, do you want to speak to that? Uh, 804. How do 840 breaks out on the team contribution? I can speak to it to say that we really don't. Um, the the team is ultimately responsible for delivering eight hundred and forty million dollars to the project, plus any cost overruns beyond that. Uh, the reality is there's there's just market work that has to be done. Uh, there's conversations with with PSL holders and and others that needs to be done before we would understand uh, where PSLs come in relative to uh, you know team debt and and the rest of it. So um, still a work in process, but the the team is is committed to to delivering that number. So yeah, you, before you, go. you definitely answered the question because I was getting to the PSL point, how that affects, you know, PSL holders. So, thank and you. I did have a question. Sure. Maybe he answered it and I didn't understand it. Where the PSLs are concerned, how many uh, PSLs do you have now? Do you know? It's in the 55,000 range. Uh, and how many do you anticipate picking up? Again, way too early to tell. Okay. Uh, now, the cost for the existing PSLs, um, what percentage, how, how do you expect, how do you um, propose charging those with existing seats uh, for uh, the cost of new, in the new stadium, for seats in the new stadium? Uh, we are offering a credit to any existing PSL holder 
for the value of the PSL the year in which they acquired it. So for example, if someone bought a PSL from the team in 2015 for $1,000 and they wanted to transition to the new building with the new PSL, they would have a $1,000 credit to apply to a new PSL in the new building. And what would a new PSL cost? It, it's again, I'm sorry, this is unsatisfying, but it's way too early to tell. There's no question that there will be PSLs that are more expensive uh, in a new building than this building, but we are also incredibly committed to maintaining a critical mass of, of affordable PSLs to the extent we have, you know, it's uh, the, the way that we're looking at it is we want to have similar entry points uh, to PSLs and tickets as we have today in this building. So um, you can kind of look at, at where we are today and, and our, our plan is to protect uh, that, those similar entry points. Uh, so, but way too early to tell, you know, kind of what the range would be and, and how many of, of each category. We, we just haven't done the research. It would frankly be a bit presumptuous. Uh, we, we don't have a, a new stadium project yet. And uh, so to go do market research uh, would make it seem like, like there's a live wire here and there's not. So uh, when the time is right, we'll do the market research and, and we'll get down to specific numbers. How will the uh, NFL uh, participate? The NFL has a program that's actually a bit in flux right now, uh, but it's a, it's a series of grants and loans. Um, and those, uh, the, the, the loans slash grants ultimately end up being waived if, if a stadium is, you know, meets certain conditions going forward. Uh, the number comes in at about $200 million uh, if, if just kind of, you know, by the book, uh, the NFL G4 program would deliver $200 million worth of effectively grants to the project. Thank you. Okay, yes, uh, Barry, I, this question is either for you or Sam, but uh, I was curious to know, um, <clears throat> is there an incentive, what incentive does the state have to give us $500 million for a new stadium versus uh, contributing to a renovation? And then on the other side of that, um, if we go into a new stadium, um, I, I don't believe I've heard any plans of what's happening with this facility in terms of um, either refurbishment or like what's going to happen with all of the the property inside of this facility. So I don't think Sam or I really would be qualified uh -huh. to speak for everyone at the state about uh, why why they supported it. But I, I do know um, it just has a lot to do with with seeing the vision for uh, you know investing in what a stadium with a cover uh, would ultimately deliver to Tennessee uh, in terms of of activity that. Um, either is investing in, in activity that's already happening for another generation, uh, or in many cases, investing in activity that's not happening now, Super Bowls, Final Fours, concerts in February, uh, that sort of thing. Um, that would really be a question for them, but that's, that's my, my best answer. Uh, in terms of what would happen with this facility, uh, well, I mean, the technical answer is the term sheet um, defines the stadium area as basically the new stadium. The rest of the land comes back to the, the city. So at that point, this would be for them to decide. But the expectation is that this building would be demolished uh, to make way for um, uh, to make way for either either just conversion of parking lots, which is probably not the case, or uh, the, the the East Bank vision that you've you've also heard about, where this becomes a um, a neighborhood with green space and you know, transportation coming through that sort of thing. Um, you may have been uh, hinting at this. We have. Um, we have thought about how uh, parts of this facility um, could potentially be repurposed. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've had a conversation, for example, with Dr. Allen at TSU about how um, anything that would be otherwise just uh, scrapped in this building could provide some sort of use for, for TSU. And it's, it's an effort that we will take on across the board. Bert, have you been on my LinkedIn page? I have not been on your LinkedIn page. Okay, I was just, you know, you... That was a nice dance you did there. It's, everybody knows big TSU energy over here. But no, um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I did have a, a follow-up question, but you you really, you just wooed me with TSU. You kind of distracted <laughs> me there. Um, it'll, it'll come back. Um, and it's clearly about the stadium, so give me one second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Burke didn't mention this, but... Um, just to be clear, the demolition of the stadium is also included in that $2.1 billion budget. I got you. I have a question, uh, Madam Chair. I have a question yes. with reference to the 1% uh, to hotel occupancy tax, occupancy tax. I've read in the term sheet something about privilege tax. Was that a 
typo or something? What's the privilege tax? Hotel privilege tax? I believe that's just the official name. Yeah. It's the state okay. statute. Okay. I just wanted to be sure because there is or was a privilege tax by the state. And I didn't know if that was something that would be creeping into this. D I don't believe so. Okay. Thank you. Just, just the way the statute authorizes the Director Barnett. Real quick, um, I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. So, so in addition to the one percent um, tax you just referred to, the the state enabling legislation <coughs> allowed for a hundred percent of the sales tax. In inside the, sta the stadium, inside the four corners of the stadium, mm -hmm. and fifty percent of an area up to one hundred and thirty acres around the stadium, and, and that, that would fifty percent of that sales tax of the of the area, right, right. And um, so, how how dependent on this project is of that one hundred thirty the success of that one hundred and thirty eight acres? Does that make sense? So, yeah, I, we've gotten this question a lot about does does the stadium, the new stadium, necessitate an intense development of um, the surrounding campus? Because it's the maintenance too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe the, the best way to answer this is to talk actually through the slide that's currently up, which is this application of excess revenues. So... Um, we believe that the stadium itself and the annual debt service can most likely be funded through the hotel tax and um, the in-stadium sales tax. And it's important, all of the, these three taxes have slightly different language in the state statute on what they can be used for. So um, the $500 million only for new stadium right. construction within enclosed, the 1% only for stadium construction of an enclosed facility as well in stadium sales tax currently enabled i think it's only to an nfl stadium or is that roughly right what so inside only nfl stadium area sales tax only nfl stadium and stadium related infrastructure and so we believe we can also use some of that area sales tax if we develop um, to pay for something like parking for example right, right? The ticket tax and uh, team rent would also be pledged to debt um, for for the new stadium construction. Um, because, because we believe that um, uh, all, all of those revenue sources are technically available to us, we just haven't quite done the final homework on whether all of that will be necessary. We do not think that the intel, an intense development is technically necessary for... Um, um, paying for a new stadium or servicing that debt. However, we also recognize that it's much better land use than putting, like we want to get away from putting stadiums on islands with surrounding parking, sure. right? I mean, it's, I think it's a much better outcome for Nashville to have the East Bank turn into a neighborhood with affordable housing and transit and green space and bikeways. And that's really... Um, that development will just generate sales sure. tax, right? And so um, necessary, technically no, likely, yes. I mean, that that is what is laid out in the vision um, uh, through the planning process of the East Bank Vision Dog. Does that answer your question? Yes. I feel yeah, like it was a little bit round of way. But. No, 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 uh, absolutely. Yeah. Madam Chair, I have another question yes. regarding the hotel tax. I, I think I read that at some point that tax may go away. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't finish the slide. Oh, okay. um, so right. so um, once the annual debt service on the stadium is uh, 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 paid for, those revenues will then flow to the capital maintenance fund. Um, we have not agreed on the size of that capital maintenance fund yet. We have not agreed on the split of that capital maintenance fund, well, that, whether that will be 100% funded by the team or 0% funded by the team. Like we just have not come to an agreement on that yet. That, that, that's saved for the definitive documents coming later. What, um, but it's in all of our interest to have a well-maintained facility. And so we wanna guarantee that. Once that fund is satisfied, it'll flow into a surplus fund. And at that point you have the ability to either um, pay back debt service early onto the sports authority bonds or 
uh, fund surplus capital maintenance. And at that point, if you funded surplus capital maintenance and paid off all the bonds, then you can turn off the HOT tax, the hotel tax. And we're, we've baked in that mechanism on the HOT, one, because it, we believe it's a major driver of revenue sources. It's probably the large, one of the larger um, revenue sources available to us for the new stadium. Um, and we want that, that shutoff mechanism. And we should all remember, this is a very happy situation, right? It means everything works, stay and develop, generate a lot of um, uh, sales tax. We have a very well-maintained and capitalized new stadium. Um, but we also don't want to be in the same problem that we have over at the convention center where cash is locked up that can't be used for other. So if all of those conditions are met, at that point, you have the option to turn off the HOT. Okay. Now, uh, you may have a slide that will explain the uh, continued collection and pledge of annual in lieu of tax payments from the water and sewer department. Uh, do you have that in one of the slides? We, we talk about it as a, an available revenue source, but um, it's worth just spending just a minute on, on the pilot. Um, what the term sheet says is in no event will the pilot extend beyond the final maturity date of the existing stadium bonds, which is 2033. It is our goal to, to shorten that time. What Director Flannery, I think, would tell you is we do not want to box ourselves in at this point. If we need to use that until 2033 because it makes the most financial sense for Nashville, we'll do that. But it is our goal to find uh, a financing structure uh, that allows us to shorten that as, as much as possible. Does that, does that $4 million they take out of the water department go away in 2033? Is that correct? Uh, it, the yeah, it, it would, it's co I believe it's coterminous with the existing revenue bonds. No. Okay. In perpetuity, but until 2033, it's pledged the existing bonds. The, again, our, our goal is to shorten that time period. We do not want it to extend. Well, I, I believe we was, I believe we were told earlier that that $4 million was going away at the start, not 2033. Is that not right? It, it is our goal that it would, uh, is that your new goal? No, no, no. Our, our, our goal has always been to keep that as short of a time period as possible. We think in under some scenarios with, again, it's a moving target with interest rates and the financing plan, but we believe we can, we're going to try and get that shut off by the opening of the new stadium. So when the stadium comes down, um, but it, we have the ability to go to 2033, but again, our goal is to shorten that as, as much as possible without paying, um, there are a lot of reasons why you might want to ex keep it the whole time, right? If we're paying a huge amount of capitalized interest on the new bonds or something, because the other revenue sources haven't, it's a little bit in the weeds, yeah. but. In your, in, in number two there on your chart about uh, park, related parking and infrastructure mm -hmm. um, funding, I somewhere, uh, we're on, we're, Metro will be on the hook for that parking garage. Is that correct? If we don't have enough revenue coming in from the taxes, and we still have to build that, that's going to be on the backs of Metro, um, correct or not? So I think the part, the parking, there's a little bit of context that I think you have to uh, acknowledge around the parking question. So one is there's um, roughly 7,500 parking spots surrounding Nissan Stadium right now. About 1,250 are for like player and VIP parking um, uh, and another 6,250 for general season ticket holders or whatever, right? Um, under this new, we just heard that um, Allegiant Field has the least amount of parking in the NFL at 3,500 spots. What we're contemplating is up some amount of the VIP parking, Burke, I think you mentioned last night, less than what is today, probably, in all likelihood. Um, and then what we're contemplating the term sheet is up to 2,000. Um, and under the current development scenarios and what we're proposing through council and RFQ and of the development parcels of phase one. So the village and several parcels on the campus that are not currently encumbered by Nissan Stadium. If we did all of that development and removed about, it's about 45 acres, we would not hit the 2000 number threshold that triggers our need to build parking or provide parking because it would still be available in surface parking. While we're talking, and, about, while we're talking about parking, <clears throat> we started construction for the new stadium mm -hmm. 
there's thousands of people that park here in these parking lots every day now. What happens to those people? Where do they park? Um, yep. I, I, What's the plan there? So, so this is this is an example of where there are some benefits to uh, the new work from home dynamic. Where um, I don't believe these parking lots are as full as they were pre-pandemic. Um, I think it's going to be, and I'll I'll let the team kind of respond to this as well. I think there's um, there are probably two solutions. One is uh, there has already been reduced demand for the parking on on site, and the second is. We're, it's an opportunity to reinvent some of these ideas, whether that's more shuttle service or um, as development around East Bank and River North come online, there there's just going to be other parking available that we'll need to work through. Do you, do you all have anything else to that? Or? I mean, it's not much different than that answer, other than just to say it is, <clears throat> it is another generation gone by thinking that we want to have as much parking right here as possible, um, because um, if you've been in uh, an ingress line or an egress line, the idea of about 7,400 cars coming to the same place at about the same time and leaving at about the same time, it, it's not a great experience, not for not for the people who come to these events and not for the people, frankly, who live around uh, the stadium or using the highways around the stadium. And so there has been this paradigm shift that I, I, know, it's, I know it seems like backwards thinking, but by reducing the number of parking spaces on site and expanding the the ways that people get to the game to kind of extend the blast radius, if you will, uh, we believe absolutely that it will actually be an enhanced experience for everyone, a more seamless experience. Las Vegas, um, they only have 3,000 spaces on site. They were rated as the number one fan experience in the NFL last year, and the the getting to and from the game was actually rated as one of their top experiences within that number one experience. And they've got shuttle service that go out into the suburbs. They've got shuttle services that are close and they have dedicated lanes where people get dropped right off at the front door. And um, they partner with parking lots and, and parking garages within half a mile or uh, you know three quarters of a mile of the facility for people who would rather drive in and park and walk. And, um, but the, the impact is instead of so many cars coming in at once and leaving at once, um, it's it ends up spreading out the experience. It's gonna be on us to actually uh, create that plan. And we've got people that are already thinking about it, already working on it, already know. There's something like 20,000 parking spaces within a mile today. And every single time I'm out in the community and I, I give a presentation on this or answer questions, I have somebody come up to me and say, I work in an office building and nobody is ever parking in that building anymore. There's gotta be a thousand spaces there and it's right across the river. You should partner with them. Um, there's not gonna be a shortage of opportunities to, to get people to and from. We're just gonna have to communicate, over communicate because there's a change of behavior for the people who have parked in some of those spaces where there's gonna be disruption because it's they're, they're not gonna be available during construction. Uh, and then in the long term, they're not gonna be available either. But we actually believe that with this paradigm shift, it's gonna be an improved experience. Hey Bert, why are you why are you up there? My question did come back, um, and I was really trying to see if you can help me just debunk this piece around the stadium because this information is dense, and between what we're actually reading here, what's out in the press, you know, I'm getting kind of mixed messages on us heading in the direction of a new stadium and understanding, like, is this stadium positioning us for to host a Super Bowl as well? Um, because from a community perspective, I'm kind of that's what I'm hearing. And so can you bring clarity to that for me? Yes, absolutely. Um, th there's this old memo uh, that is making the rounds on uh, the Google machine. Uh, uh, the NFL used to require 70,000 uh, capacity to host a Super Bowl. That has long been a program they've moved past. Um, their philosophy is the one that they've actually been asking us to adopt, which is don't build to an arbitrary number, but build the right number of experiences um, where there's not a bad experience in the house. And in most markets, uh, the more you build out, you end up creating nosebleed seats that nobody really wants to sit there, right? And so get 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 a building right. Have, have as many experiences as you're gonna have, have them all be right. And they totally support 60,000. Actually, I think if you talk, talk to some of the people at the league who, who work on these things, they would actually encourage us to think about taking more out. But we believe that 60,000 is the right number. And they're absolutely, well past that that arbitrary Super Bowl cap. And we actually, um, uh, Peter Riley, who's the executive vice president of NFL events, he's the he runs the team that that goes out and works to, to find the right sites and make recommendations to the owners about right sites for Super Bowl combine draft. Um, he, he issued a statement saying just that, 
there is no minimum capacity. They're excited about this building. They're proud of this building. Um, I said last night, I, you know, I don't think they're going to tell you who their favorite child is, um, but they are really, really impressed with the design of this building and, and the future of the NFL in Nashville. And I have every expectation that the NFL will bring its biggest events here. Uh, it includes the Super Bowl, but it also includes, you know, the draft coming back. Uh, it includes the combine, which would be an opportunity that we wouldn't have otherwise because you need an indoor facility. It's hosted in February. Um, so absolutely, I believe that we would get a Super Bowl if not many Super Bowls over the, the coming decades. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may ask a question regarding the, this is term sheet question. Yes. So okay. That's Sam. Okay. Page three of uh, this. But let, if we can pause, let's see if we can move through this presentation and jump in as we get to the slides. Okay. That way we're moving it forward. How about that? We're still talking about funding. Uh, sure. Where are we at? We're, we're still in funding. That's a good right? question. I think so. <laughs> talking about funding. All right. Um, are we talking about funding? So let's go to the next slide. Um, operations and maintenance. Um, and I'll, I'll try and go through these really fast. So um, the Titans will be responsible for all costs operating the stadium, including utilities, insurance, maintenance costs, capital repairs, capital improvements. Um, again, this is something we're really proud of in this term sheet. Um, I think I think it will resonate with you all. We're shifting the cost of insurance to the team. Historically, that's been a Metro and Sports Authority um, liability, but under this new deal, we're going to shift that to the team. Um, we, we do not have um, a, another thing that we're really proud of, and the team has been, um, um, we've had a lot of conversations about this, but, you know, trying to get this, the Metro out and the sports authority out of the stadium maintenance business, right? So under this under this deal, um, ultimate responsibility for making sure that this is a um, well-maintained stadium shifts from the city to the team, which means that uh, we are then in the, you all are really in the enforcement seat, right? So right now the team is coming back and saying, you know, we've got these repairs, it's now $35 million, you know, where where's our... Uh, like we need to go do these repairs or um, improvements and under the new deal, it would be the opposite. We would be going to the team and saying, Hey, you know, this new lease says that you need to maintain it in this class. We have a report that, you know, we have an agreement that says, uh, you know, these lights need to be repaired, right? It, it's putting, um, it's, swift, it's um, switching the dynamic there, uh, which I think is really important and good for the city. Um, and to ensure that, um, uh, you all will have help. You don't have to do this yourself. Um, every three years, the Titans will engage an independent third party to produce a capital asset management plan um, to create and update a 10 year projection of what those maintenance costs, the costs might be, right? So again, um, whether it's with this or with um, the accounting under the new deal, like we, we want to find you all competent um, experts that will be funded um, to help you all um, enforce enforce any new deal. Uh, next slide. Um, the lease will be coterminous with the life of the bonds. We we think this will be roughly 30 uh, 30 year bonds um, plus five uh, three five year renewal terms. Um, the authority will also lease the stadium TSU. Um, that will be in a separate agreement between the team TSU and the authority. Um, uh, and then the authority will also have uh, use of the stadium for five civic events. Uh, and importantly, um, part of this new deal uh, will kind of reset the the time commitment for the team and the city, and um, so the documents will be accompanied by a, a, a strict non-relocation agreement. Next slide. We talked our, our already a little bit about campus development, but Metro will control the development of everything outside the stadium drip line. Um, Metro will pick up responsibility for infrastructure necessary for development on the non-stadium site development outside of the stadium and the village, uh, which are those, again, those two parcels to the north and south of the new stadium site. Um, there's obviously going to be a, a need for a lot of uh, um, close agreement. We kind of talk about this in terms of harmony on the site between both the team and Metro and the Sports Authority. And so the site will be governed by a site coordination agreement um, to work through any operational issues, game day, not event, both event and not event day issues. Um, uh, we'll also enter into a separate parking facilities agreement. Um, 
and then we will uh, make sure that both the village and the site uh, accommodate an appropriate amount of parking spaces for players and coaches in the in the village or near the stadium, and then for for patrons um, and users on on the campus. I have a quick question on yes, the parking. Um, the second bullet bullet point mm -hmm. where it talks about the authority being responsible for a minimum of two thousand surface or structural parking spots, and uh, that stadium code uh, would receive. All the revenue from that during those uh, events of uh, on on event days, yes. right? Yeah. And then uh, Tennessee State on their uh, days would receive their negotiated piece. And then it says that at all other times, Metro government should be entitled to such parking spaces and retain all revenues related there too. Mm -hmm. My question is: It says next says that the authority shall be responsible for all capital maintenance and repair of these parking spaces. So it looks like revenues are going everywhere else, and we're going to keep it up. Is that the way that structure? Um, so. The most important thing I think to remember about any stadium related parking is that sale area sales tax revenue is available to pay Metro and sports authority back for that infrastructure. So that parking would be paid for, we believe by that area sales tax revenue. So you all get the revenue and the use on non event days. Um, and then to supplement that it would be the area sales tax revenue. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, parking. Other than CMA and TSU, all revenue for the other, we're entitled to five events that the authority has control over. Right. But, but the way I'm reading this, we don't get, we don't get anything from parking with our five events. It all goes to the Titans. Is that correct? Um, I don't think that's correct. I think any parking that you all have, would, uh, if it's a sports authority, one of those civic events, I think you capture that revenue. Is there way we could negotiate for more than five events for the sports authority <laughs> um i mean i mean because you know we, we have a very small budget if you ever look at our budget mm -hmm. and the things that we have to do and things that we're in charge of to have to get done our, our budget is shrinking with some of the things we're losing in, in in the transfer but we're taking a burden off of the backs of the taxpayers in nashville which is good but we still got a job to do and our our revenue, we're going to lose some of the, the, the ticket stuff there. So, I think um, I tried to speak to this earlier, but maybe not that articulately. Um, one of our goals is we recognize the burden that you all take on in enforcement of contracts, and um, we have heard from um, the director and and um, past board members that they really need more resources around this, both. Um, whether it's accounting or operational or um, third party help. And we're, we're committed to, to making that work. Um, and not just in a, in like a loose promise way, like we want to have dedicated revenue for that type of work to be done because we're talking about a really big deal here, right? Well, uh, in closed stadium, I can see where we're going to have more events other yeah. than, than the football. Definitely. And that's, that's what it's designed to do. Mm -hmm. and, and that's good. But, I think we need to have a little bit bigger bite on that than what we have here with five. Yeah, I um, we'll we'll take the the exact number of, of oh, we can't commit to anything here today. We'll take that offline and see see what we can come up with a reasonable number. Just planting the seed. Pr appreciate that, but the, well, the the broader point I, I want to make though. Um, on the enforceability and just give, make sure you all are well resourced. Like we are committed to that and we want to make sure that not only it's not an empty promise, it's actually a funded promise where if you all need third party resources to help you um, monitor the lease in the future, like you, that is made available to you all. And then Burke, you want to talk today? Just to clarify on the civic events, um, that's a carryover from this current building. You all have the right to do five civic events per year here. To my knowledge, you did it once in the last 25 years, um, it was a Billy Graham crusade, I believe, uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and you've explored it several times, but ultimately decide against it. The reason being, the things that you would think to do um, for, for civic events um, usually don't drive a lot of revenue, and it costs a lot of money to operate the stadium on a game day or an so event day. Civic events only? Correct. What's really clear on this, though, what, what, sorry, what needs to be really clear on this from a parking perspective, um, those those 2,000 parking spaces, the vision here is when you take out Titans games, concerts, TSU, CMA, 
let's say that's 40, 50 um, days a year, what would that be? The other 310 days a year, that's for the authority to, to figure out what you want to do with it. And so if you want to charge five, 10, $15, uh, you know, spike it on weekends or around other things, like that's for you to decide. That's there's 310 days a year that the authority has a garage that if the, um, the vision is, is borne out, the East Bank vision will be a really active part of town where there may be some, some very real, I mean, we, we've heard rumors that there's gonna be a performing arts center um, that would be located right here. Um, that has nothing to do with any of that. So there would be some, a new toy to play with, let's put it that way, for the sports authority perspective for 310-ish days a year for, from a revenue perspective. Madam Chair, I have a, oh, you're coming back. Okay. <laughs> be here all day. <laughs> um, I would like for you to speak to uh, TSU's uh, commitment uh, to leasing the facility. Yeah, um, I, I actually think the team's probably better suited to speak to this. Thank you uh, for that question. I, I think one of the things we're probably most proud of about uh, this new envisioned one community plan that we put together is how the partnership with Tennessee State can be enhanced as part of it. Um, to kind of cut to the to the chase on it, uh, we're looking at. Before you get into, I think everyone's not familiar, oh, so if you don't mind, fair enough. You introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so fair enough. Adolfo Birch, uh, I am uh, the senior vice president of business affairs and uh, chief legal officer for the Titans. Used to be at the uh, NFL's headquarters in New York, working with all the people that Birch's been talking about earlier. <laughs> Uh, and I'm uh, certainly a native Nashvilleian, so I, I, I know a fair amount about kind of how, how this city is looking at things. Um, so to get back to, to, to TSU, um, I think if we're looking at how this agreement can benefit TSU, you can look at three different areas. Uh, what we've agreed to as part of this partnership is one focused on the stadium and gameplay. Uh, and in that sense, we will be working with TSU to let TSU host uh, as many games as as they would be able to host under the current lease. Uh, but we do a couple of different things. Uh, one, I should probably add that all of this is subject to uh, the approval of, of many sort of entities as part of the new lease, including Sports Authority would have some uh, ability to weigh in on, on these. But this is the framework that we've kind of agreed to with Tennessee State and uh, the, the mayor's office and others to, to try to work this out. So uh, the frame, that framework would include letting uh, TSU host games. Uh, it would also mean for each game that the stadium usage fees would be covered by the team. Uh, they would play without rent. Uh, there was a modest level of rent that they were paying uh, to Sports Authority over the over the years. Uh, that would be eliminated. Yes, sir. Covered by the team. Team being. Yes, it'd be waived. That TSU would be playing rent free, and they usually we would charge back the uh, um, the actual sort of expenses associated with right. with uh, you, you running the game by the team and i was assuming you meant titans oh yes yeah, okay. yes okay. yes Thank yes um uh and uh and we'd also have the ability or state would have the ability to get a payment in lieu of any dates that they did not use uh so we we've agreed as a team to provide a cash uh, you know cash payment or contribution for each game of the ones that they are able to play if they choose not to play them. Uh, and, you know, if they want to play a game in Hale Stadium, for example, they don't use the date, we would give them a contribution uh, in that respect for that game. Um, we also have agreed to become the presenting sponsor of the John Merritt Classic. Uh, and that would enable us to do a number of things that we think would be very beneficial to to Tennessee State, uh, including one, all the fees obviously would be waived, but we would be providing our internal resources to assist in the production and event operation of that game. Uh, so that would include everything from uh, resource, uh, you know, resources on ticketing, on event operations, on game day, on fan experience, on sponsorship, 
uh, whatever ways that our team here at the at the uh, Titans can assist to improve and enhance the event itself uh, through you know the creation of fan fests. Uh, we would we are we are already uh, signed on to do a a reception for students the week of the game, uh, in which we would provide scholarships uh, and any number of things that we think ultimately would help that merit classic. Uh, be better promoted, uh, be you know more impactful uh, for the for the team and and the city in that respect. Uh, second sort of big bucket of things is student support, uh, and that comes in three different ways. Uh, one is we are committed to uh, creating a series of internships, apprenticeships, job shadows, uh, and other things that will be available for TSU students and recent graduates. Uh, we are um, creating a fellowship program, uh, the Bud Adams Fellowship, that we will reserve a certain number of those slots per year, strictly for Tennessee State students. Uh, and then um, we also, uh, on the uh, student support, sorry, let me take a peek at that. Um, on this uh, student support side, we're going to have, uh, make our senior leadership available to assist Tennessee State uh, in their academic programming. Uh, so their sport management program, the sport performance program, will come and be speakers. Uh, we will provide uh, some of our leadership to be adjunct professors uh, and other things that will help uh, TSU, TSU on the academic uh, support side. Um, third sort of bucket is branding and promotion. And one of the aspects of our partnership would be to uh, recognize and celebrate Tennessee State and Tennessee State athletics during one of the Titans games per year. So that think of that as a branding and promotional opportunity for Tennessee State to be recognized during the course of our games, obviously nationally telecast and, and uh, the benefits that come along with that. Uh, we would be providing a uh, you know video board work uh, allowing a space and creating a space for exhibitions, maybe of memorabilia and other things to help drive in interest uh, in TSU and TSU athletics during that game. Uh, and then the final piece uh, we alluded to earlier, uh, one of the things we're committed to trying to do is as this building is taken down, the things that we can try to repurpose uh, and that might be of value and benefit to uh, TSU at Hale Stadium as the likely, you know, likely destination. But uh, those things we're going to try uh, to, to make sure we can make available. You know, we, we, we can't quite be specific about it because you don't know what exactly you can, you know, remove and repurpose, how that affects and impacts the uh, demolition schedule and all that. But uh, we're certainly going to try. And uh, I think you know, when you look at that as a as a sort of whole, uh, TSU is very satisfied that uh, this represents the type of enhancement to the partnership uh, with you know a a partner in our case, our first partner uh, when, upon coming to Tennessee, uh, and and we're we're very proud of it, and hope, hopefully it'll be uh, to everybody's benefit. Thank you. I have one other question, oh. and maybe you don't answer this. What is the projected uh, cost of the lease that we will have with TSU? Does that mean, do you mean rent? It's going to be free. Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's free. free. Everything. Yes. Okay. That's, and, so, that so I, I know I'm just, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. again, it's you subject, already, there are people that have to approve, you know, the, the lease is subject to a series of approvals, but that's that's the framework that we're working on. I guess my, my I guess under misunderstanding. Room, oh, yes. <laughs> you, thank you. Yes, that would be part of it as well. Um, okay. They have a fully branded locker room that, um, and one of the things, I think to go back to a point that was asked earlier, when you're looking at what the NFL is looking for um, and, you know, standards and things, one of those things that they look at for Super Bowl purposes is the nature and ability of the locker rooms to be used in a certain way. Yeah. And one of the side benefits of having the TSU dedicated locker room will be that it fulfills that purpose 
that the NFL is looking for in terms of, you know, a Super Bowl potential venue. Okay. And I, I asked my question because in this term sheet, uh, it was mentioned that uh, the authority would be leasing um, or would it, TSU would be. Term, what's yeah, term, I think it's a three-way agreement between the authority of the team and TSU. Uh, okay. And so, so the authority would be party to yeah, that. Yeah. I like the free part. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, again, to encourage you all to watch the meeting last night, the architect, David Manica, talked, um, and Burke talked a little bit last night about the opportunities the new building um, has for TSU and um, just around even, like, things simple as that I would never think of, but you know, the difference between signs, like digital signs. So it'll be a lot easier to turn over the new building for um, TSU events and really make it feel like a home game for them. I just want to say to Mr. Birch, Mrs. Matthews, I know you all are working on that project. I read the report and uh, as a TSU alum, I'm very pleased to see this partnership kind of come full circle. I know TSU has been a committed partner from the beginning. Um, and so thank you for this framework. I know it's up for a series of approvals, but I'm pleased to hear that. Yes. One other question before we go. Do you have anything for me? Uh, I don't think I had. I, I think I answered the no, question. No? no. The last time Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, uh, and this is in connection with the, uh, the ability of the city to uh, own part of it. Yeah. It's, think, but you said the state it was against state law state constitution i believe state constitution <laughs> and you were going to provide me with documentation oh i'm sorry oh well our lawyers fell down on the job okay all uh, right no I, we'll, we'll send that over to you but okay. uh, we'll send you the specific language it's not it's practically impossible to do under okay. Tennessee state well, law for a municipality to invest in a private enterprise but you still will provide that yeah, absolutely all right yeah sorry about that all right okay so we're getting close on time is there anything that you want to make sure you revisit with us in your slides? Uh, I, oh. You got a question here? I do before oh, you go, go but I, 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 think this, I think this is the... Well, then finish this off. Um, I think you can tell that we've seen a lot of this before, I think, yeah. and we've had time to digest it, and now we have tons of questions, so I think that's... Yeah, the, I guess the last slide I would just spend a minute on okay. is if you can slide um, flip this is just a graphical representation of the excess revenues and then yeah. the next slide on on calendar so um the ordinance for the one percent hot tax um approval of the term sheet and then um the uh resolution approving the our, our solicitation um for campus development is all has all been introduced in council now we will continue to come back to the sports authority every month to give you all an update on on where we are on definitive documents um we expect those definitive documents to um, come back through the Sports Authority and Council in Q1 of next year. Um, assuming everything is approved, we would be looking to for the Sports Authority to issue bonds in Q2, Q3 of 23 um, when we finalize the budget and um, all the all the funding um, mechanisms are uh, uh, validated and, and uh, approved. So. Uh, but with that, I think that is truly the last slide. That's helpful. Thank you. Now, we appreciate you, and we're going to open up for our final questions now. Oh. So I think our next meeting is December 1st, mm -hmm. where we are anticipated to vote on the proposed term sheet. So that leads me into we've had a number of questions and comments, and I know we could continue on and still have a few but um in the interest of time uh could the administration provide like a frequently asked questions on you know we've heard a lot in various sources and channels but um kind of an overview in advance for us being asked to take action on the first yeah ha happy to do that um and then i also just want to again shout out the council's work so they've created a website the east bank stadium mm -hmm. committee where um as council members are also submitting questions uh which there are a lot of but we're um working with um the administration is trying to provide answers on a semi-regular basis weekly basis and those questions and answers are also posted on the website so i'll send that 
in addition to our legal research, I'll also send the uh, the link to those questions, and then we'll we'll try to put it together a document for you all that might be a little bit more sports authority related. Yeah, uh, I think that would be helpful. On, you know, with Metro Legal's mm -hmm. review, just to help us sure. sit in this seat and do our job and understand all the dynamics. Yeah, happy to. Thank you. Any yeah. other questions? Uh, I have sure. a question, but mm -hmm. I don't know that you answered this. Uh, the uh, term sheet indicated that uh, the sports authority will have final approval rights over the uh, architect and construction manager when uh, the process, or whatever it is. I, I think we missed out on that, didn't we? So the design architect is different than the final construction architect. Um, but Tom, do you want to speak to this? Actually, Mike, I can speak to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, uh, Annika, I think, was engaged to do concept <coughs> in, in order to produce for construction plans and specifications, they're going to need to engage somebody with uh, that, that does that kind of work. And I don't, I, I don't know exactly who it's going to be, but there's a small list of players who are capable of doing that. Populous, the name always comes up. So there's going to need to be another engagement. Yeah, I, I can take it. So um, what we've released and what you've seen are design concepts. That's not even a true, full architectural design. Um, we did it that way because um, before going through this process and, and you know, having these conversations only to find out that the numbers were way wrong or whoops, a building doesn't actually fit on that, that piece of property. Um, we engaged, we, we went to eight architects and, and solicited what their process would be to get us as, um, as measured and specific as possible, a design concept that would fit on that property to the east. And then we brought her along uh, two uh, contractors that just measured the whole time and were giving us uh, budgetary related feedback so that this budget that we've produced, they're, re they're real numbers. They're, it's, not a, it's not a GMP, it's not a locked in price, but these are numbers that have been scrubbed by contractors. That was the purpose of doing a real design concept ahead of when you would normally do something like this. Um, there will be a process to, uh, to uh, solicit and, and ultimately hire an architect of record um, that has not started yet at all. And so that's that is still that is that is still waiting approval of of this project. Thank you. I, I'm going to give a shout out to Burke uh, when he uh, briefed the uh, renderings of the Titan Stadium for someone who has sat in the nosebleed uh, seats at, at this stadium. Uh, I asked him uh, during the presentation, I said, the high seat in the new stadium versus the high seat in the in this stadium. It's 40 feet closer to the field in the new stadium than you are at this stadium here. Uh -huh. And that's a plus. Uh, it's 30 feet. Okay. All right, okay. <laughs> I've been telling everybody 40. Okay. 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 Good. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's closer and it's, it's much lower as well. You're a lot closer. I tried to get them to put an oxygen uh, tin in uh, going up in steps, but they didn't would do it. So just for your seat. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? Not Sam. Thank you so much, yeah, Burke. Thank you so much. No. Sure, absolutely. I just we, you were talking about places to look for things. Uh, we would also point you to uh, the TennesseeTitans.com slash new dash stadium. Today, but don't. no dash, no. <laughs> okay, but that's a, a, a place we've captured a lot of the stuff we were talking about today on the right. one community as well as the deal itself. So. And I, right. Madam Chair, I'd like to say one thing um, in the question and in, in having Adolfo recognize himself or be introduced, he is the son of the late Justice Adolfo Birch. Yes. So if you didn't know that, I just wanted to. A moment in history. <laughs> um, thank you. Well, thanks to everyone. And Monica, perhaps you can send that website out to the members so that we'll have access to that. Again, thank you, Sam, and thank you, Burke, for uh, presenting this morning. Thank you to the board for a delightful conversation. I know that we're not done. There are more questions. Uh, but this does conclude our agenda for today. Uh, thank you to Madam Chair, if I could, I'd like to take this moment to remind everyone tomorrow is Veterans Day. 
We have a parade that uh, starts at 14th and West End uh, Broadway at 1100 hours sharp tomorrow. And I'd like to see all of you out there. I know all the, the mayor and the, maybe even the governor and everybody else. And so I'd like to see some Titans out there tomorrow. So thank you all. Thank you, General. Um, and we want to thank Metro Finance, Metro Legal, our facility team representatives, the mayor's office, and Russ Simon for being here this morning. Uh, we will have our next call sports authority meeting on Thursday, December 1st, and this will be the final meeting of this year. Um, in the regular board meeting, uh, we expect a recommendation from the finance committee. So if you have not had all of your questions answered the finance committee will meet and you'll receive information on that feel free to join that committee and finalize any questions you may have uh, because we will be uh, they will recommend a resolution for approval at the full board meeting any questions before we close well thank you everyone consider this meeting adjourned thank you This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.